Lord, you are so good. We want to give ourselves to you. God, we thank you that we can come to you in faith, that you care about everything in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you honor our generosity, and we thank you for your call to continue to grow there. Lord, we love you and pray this in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated, friends. So last week, Pastor Joseph was telling you about some folks who were very generous, and he told you just a little bit about them, and I wanted to fill you in a little more on that, that story that we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Uh, Paul is telling us a story. He's giving us an example of uh, basically two churches. He's writing to this church in Corinth, and Corinth is a very affluent area. Uh, it was a place, it was kind of almost like a Silicon Valley of their day, if you will. Uh, it has a port city, lots of trade going in there, uh, lots of good stuff happening in Corinth. And when Paul's talking to the Corinthians, uh, he's talking to them as newer believers because they hadn't known Jesus for very long. This is a new church, a lot of new Christians there, and in many ways they were growing in their faith. But in other ways, they needed to grow more. And so Paul is challenging them to do just that. And one of the ways that he's challenging them to grow is in their generosity. And so Paul uses another church as an example to them. And he says, if you really want to be generous, you want to be like these other guys, these Macedonians, because they are very, very generous. They're a model for generosity. In fact, the Macedonian church is mentioned four times in the New Testament as a model of generosity. And so you think, well, what's this church in Macedonia like? They're so generous. They must have been blessed with great resources so that they can give generously to others. But that's not really the case. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you can turn there in your Bibles if you want, or it's on the screen. Uh, verse 1, Paul says this, I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done for the churches in Macedonia. Though they have, uh, excuse me, though they've been going through much trouble and hard times, their wonderful joy and deep poverty have overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. Another translation of those verses say that they were going through severe affliction and extreme poverty. So the Macedonians, they're an example of generosity, and yet they themselves are going through so much pain financially. It's almost like a Silicon Valley in Corinth and a Detroit in Macedonia. And yet God uses the people in ancient Detroit, if you will, to use them and say, this is the example. These are the ones who are setting the bar. These are the guys that you want to be like when it comes to being generous. And, and we don't know what, what their situation, I mean, we haven't experienced their kind of situation. They talk about, talk about extreme poverty in their whole church. And perhaps some of us here have lived or even may live in extreme poverty. But as a church, that's not our reality. We're kind of a normal average group of people here in Dayton. Uh, most of us are not concerned about where our next meal comes from. Most of us have a place uh, to lay our head down each night. We don't know what that kind of poverty is like, but that's what the Macedonians lived like. They lived in extreme poverty. But yeah, listen to what they did, verse 4. They begged us again and again for the gracious privilege of sharing in the gift for the Christians in Jerusalem. Best of all, they went beyond our highest hopes, for their first action was to dedicate themselves to the Lord and for whatever directions God may give them. So we urged Titus, who encouraged you in your giving in the first place, to return to you and complete your share of this ministry offering, or excuse me, this ministry of giving. And what they're doing there is the church in Jerusalem was also a very impoverished place. Uh, they had uh, political concerns there because they were a church made of people who had left the Jewish faith people who were being persecuted for leaving the Jewish faith, some who had relied on the, the social services of the Jewish temple uh, to help them out, and they no longer had those resources. And so the, the, Paul is collecting an offering for them, and he's challenging the other churches to give. And yet these Macedonians, they step forth in such great faith. And it's interesting because he uses them as a contrast to the Corinthians who have great resources but haven't stepped forward as much. And so, how does this work? How, does a people, how do a people like the Macedonians step forth in such generosity? Well, if you're taking notes, uh, you'll see this first. If your joy is in the God of money, you have no reason for generosity. If your joy is in the God of money, you have no reason for generosity. Because it's a simple mathematical issue, right? If, if your joy is the God of money, then naturally, you simply want to acquire more money and so generosity is going to mean you have less money, so you're not so likely to be generous, right? 
And, and when we look at our own lives and we look at our own generosity, we understand better our love for God. Because if our God is the one who gave himself for us, it's a natural thing that we want to be generous with others because we've experienced that kind of generosity from our God. Whereas if our God is our possessions, our stuff, then ah, not so much. And, and as Americans, this is a challenge. Perhaps it's one of the greatest spiritual challenges we face because we live in a world that constantly tells you that more and more and more is better and is essential and that your value is in what you have. Friends, don't believe that lie. Don't believe that lie. Your value is in who you are in Jesus Christ, not in where you live, what you drive, what you wear, or any other of those temporal things. And the Macedonians, they got this. They understood this. The Corinthians, they were growing in it because they had a different version of generosity in Corinth. You see, in Corinth, when, when they gave, they expected something in return because that was their culture. Uh, uh, some big differences in their culture and our culture. Uh, there in, in Roman culture in those days, there were two main things that we have today that, that they did not have. Uh, financial tools for if you've come upon hard times. You know, today if you come upon hard times, there's a number of ways that you can get help and support. But in those days, they didn't have, first of all, they didn't have banks that would loan you money on an individual personal basis to help with your personal financial problems. Like today, if uh, you, let's say you're running a little short on money and your TV goes out and you determine that you need a new TV, but not only that, you need a really nice new TV, you don't have to have the money to buy it, right? You can go to the bank or you can use your bank-sponsored credit card and you can buy it. It's not a good idea. It gets you into lots of trouble later on, but you can do that. They didn't have those options in those days. If you didn't have money, you weren't going to be able to go to a bank and just suddenly get money for the things that you needed. The second thing that they didn't have that we have today, they didn't have nearly as developed of a social, uh, net, a social welfare system that would take care of those who were in need. Uh, let, let's take, for example, um, in our day, if, if an 18-year-old girl gets pregnant and her family's not able to support her, uh, she really doesn't have much for, for marketable skills to be able to earn significant level of income. Plus, she has responsibilities now for child care, and, and the father's not too much help. In our world, we've got some options. They're not easy options. It's a hard road to walk, but there are options. We have, we have food stamps. Uh, we have welfare. We have other programs uh, that can help to ensure that she and that child are going to be able to have some resources, hopefully, uh, to be able to advance her and her child forward in life and to be able to, to uh, get out of that position. In Rome, they didn't have those options. In Corinth, they didn't have those options. That wasn't a value in their society. In fact, they, they had a tradition in that kind of situation uh, called infant exposure. And what they would do, uh, no joke, is in that kind of situation, the mom would take the baby, would take the baby outside of the city, and would leave it, would abandon it. And it would be exposed to elements, to wild animals, to whatever happened to it. And one of the first things that the Christian church became known for was its generosity in this area because the Christians would find out where they were exposing babies at and the Christians, they would go out to these areas and they would take these babies and they would adopt them as their own and take care of them. Why? Because they served such a generous God and they didn't want any of his children to be abandoned. They didn't want any of his children to be hurting. So they didn't have the same social services that, that we enjoy today. And so in Corinth, what would you do if you got yourself in financial trouble? What, what were your alternatives? Well, the main one was this. You would find a wealthy person to be your benefactor, your benefactor. And a benefactor was someone who was wealthy and who saw your situation and was willing to help out and, and to pay your debt for you, to take care of whatever that need was that you had. It was a great thing. It might be your only lifeline, in fact. But there were strings attached. This was not just generosity. Uh, this was a, a, a legal, committed relationship that you entered. You didn't just get to take the gift and go. You had certain legal responsibilities, one of which was you had to, if the person was running for office, you had to support them by definition. You didn't have any other option but, but to support their campaign. In fact, you had to vote for them by law, and you had to campaign for them by law. 
So, so let's say uh, Jeff's here on the front row. Let's say that Jeff, I, I've fallen into some hard times, right? And I go to Jeff and I say, Jeff, I'm in serious trouble. I'm behind on my bills. They're going to come and take my home. I don't know what to do. And Jeff says, well, that's okay, John. I've got some extra money and, and I can help. I can pay off those bills for you and, and I'll be your benefactor, okay? Now, that's great. I, my, my house problem is solved, but now I have a responsibility to Jeff. And so I go around and my job is to tell everybody just how great Jeff is. I mean, if you guys met Jeff, he is the most generous, incredible person I have ever met in my life. If you don't know Jeff, you need to meet this guy. Because I met him, and he changed my life. He, he just, I mean, uh, uh, of all men in Rome, there it is right there, Jeff. I mean, I mean, the ladies already know this, right? But guys, if you want a model guy, right there, Jeff. He is amazing. Incredible. <laughs> Just, just so good. Yeah, it's only one lady, Sue, can be so lucky to be married to Jeff because that's just how awesome he really is. <laughs> She's saying his head keeps going like this. It's going to be bad later. But, but, but that's what you do. You'd go around, and that was kind of your job. Depending on the level of debt that you had to Jeff or that I had to Jeff, I, I might have to be a servant. I might have to be a servant for a period of time, or I may have to actually be a slave for life, depending how deep I was in it. And that's what you had to do. There weren't a whole lot of other options. So when the Corinthians thought of generosity, they thought more in terms of these things. Oh, okay, if I give to this, then I expect something in return. It, it's, it's a uh, superior, inferior kind of relationship that we have. We don't have that so much in our world today or in the United States today. Uh, it's a little hard to come up with examples of what that might look like, but I think I've thought of one. And I have kind of a dual purpose here because last week we had Joseph here who gave a great message, but he gave some illustrations that I did not understand. He talked primarily from TV shows from the early 1970s, and he quoted these AM radio guys. Does, who listens to AM radio, right? I mean, I've never listened to AM radio. So trying to redeem my pulpit a little bit this morning by bringing back illustrations that happened in this century, okay? So... <laughs> So this one may be, this one, this one may go over some of your heads, but do we have any fans of the movie Napoleon Dynamite in here? You have, all right, good. Last night I was so disappointed because there were hardly any. But, but nevertheless, Napoleon Dynamite is uh, it's a great movie, and it tells a story about a guy. Uh, he's kind of a nerdy high schooler, and, and uh, he's doing a variety of things, but one of which is he's campaigning for his friend Pedro. Pedro is running for office. He wants to, be, uh, he wants to help Pedro get elected, and uh, he, he's hoping that, that by, through his campaigning, Pedro will be elected. And, and yet there's going to be some strings attached with Pedro because, because Pedro is going to offer, if you vote for Pedro, he's going to offer his protection to you, okay? So I think we've got Napoleon here with us this morning. Is Napoleon in the house, perhaps? I was hoping he'd come out now. Hey, there he is. All right. Welcome, Napoleon Dynamite, everybody. Excited to have him here with us. <laughs> I don't know if I can do this. Sorry. <laughs> what? Sorry, Napoleon. So, Napoleon, tell me. There was, a, there was an election at your school, and uh, there's this girl named Summer. And she was running for, for office. Uh, did you vote for Summer? Yeah, right. I'm not voting for her. You didn't vote for Summer. Well, well so who are you voting for, Napoleon? I'm voting for Pedro Sanchez. Who do you think? Gosh! <laughs> A little feisty, isn't he? Well, so, so do you think, should I vote for Pedro? Should we all vote for Pedro Sanchez? Yeah. Why? Why should we do that? Because he's freaking sweet. <laughs> it is hard to argue with that logic now, isn't it? <laughs> um, all right, so what, what would Pedro do for me if I voted for him? Pedro offers you protection if you vote for him. If you're having trouble with bullies picking on you, uh, Pedro and his family will, will protect you from harm if you vote for him. Hmm. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Uh, bullies picking on you, that, that's probably something you've experienced, I'm just speculating, right? Whatever. I spent last summer with my uncle in Alaska hunting wolverines. <laughs> You've got to watch out for those guys who are spending the summer hunting wolverines. So, Pedro, I see you brought some tots. Can, or Napoleon, you brought some tots. Can I have some of your tots? Get your own flipping tots. Gosh. Oh, sure, tots. You, you can have some of mine when you dance like this. Oh, boy.
So if you've never seen Napoleon Dynamite, you may be inspired now, but I have to warn you, if you haven't seen it so far, there's a good chance after watching it that you'll come and ask me for that hour and a half of your life back, but I can't give it to you, so you at least got to YouTube it though, right? But this is an example of a modern day benefactor. In the movie, uh, when, when some of these kids who are having trouble with bullies are being picked on, Pedro's cousins come. They always just seem to come out of nowhere, and they come to protect him. Why? Because it's this benefactor-beneficiary relationship. And that's a little bit what the Corinthian church were used to. They were used to being the benefactors. These were the guys in power. They were the ones with money. They were the ones who, when they gave, they expected something in, in return. And so this is so relevant to, to the Corinthians because, because what Paul is helping them to do is he's helping them to see that they've got this all wrong. They don't get what generosity is all about. You see, in, in, in God's economy, you don't give so that you can get something back. Jesus gave his life freely. You have this choice whether to accept or, or to reject his free gift. It, it, it's, it's an option that you have. He didn't give his life for you expecting that you would owe him something. You have the choice to accept or to reject it. But it's the best gift in the whole world. It's the most incredible gift. It will change your life. It will change the way that you look at life. It'll, it'll give you meaning and purpose. It'll change the way that you understand your resources and all sorts of things. Because see, when we understand how good God is, it gives us a different look at generosity. It gives us a different look at this. We understand, if you're taking notes, that God is the benefactor and we are the beneficiaries of God's grace. This turned it on its head for the Corinthians. They're not the benefactors. No, God is the benefactor. Why? Well, the Bible teaches us that God is the creator of everything. God created the world. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the Bible says. We sing that song, uh, He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? That, that God owns everything. Um, and, so, and the reason is because He's the creator. So the things that I consider to be mine are really God's resources that He's entrusting to me. God entrusts each of, each of us as managers or as stewards of his resources. He entrusts those things to us, and we're responsible for the way that, that we utilize them. Also in your notes, you'll see that God is generous with us, and so we, share our, we show our thanks by being generous with others. That's a natural thing. God is generous with us, and when someone is so generous with us, it's only natural that we want to be generous with others, that we want to extend that same type of generosity towards others. You know, do we have any gardeners in here? Gardeners? Anybody? You know what? We may have more Napoleon Dynamite fans than gardeners in this congregation. <laughs> I bet that's never been surveyed before, but now you know. So let's say, was it a good year for tomatoes, gardeners? Yeah? Okay. I think it was in my area because all the local gardeners gave me their tomatoes, which is so generous. Uh, so I was assuming it was a good year for tomatoes. So let's say that you're a gardener and you have just a bumper crop of tomatoes this year and you have a couple of, of sweet senior citizen neighbors who, who used to garden. They can't garden anymore. It's a little too much work. And so you get a nice big bag of these tomatoes ready and you take them over to their house and you knock on the door and the gentleman answers the door. You hand him the tomatoes and say, hey, I had extra tomatoes this year and I just wanted to share some with you. Would you take these, enjoy them, share them with your wife, hope, that, hope these are a blessing to you all. And so he says, okay, thanks. And he shuts the door. The next day, you're out uh, working in your garden, and you see, uh, you see his wife come out, and she's out sitting on the porch, and you say, hey, did you enjoy those tomatoes? Were they all right? And she says, well, I wouldn't know, because last night, he came in with those tomatoes. He sat down in the chair, and he ate every single one of them. 
Can you imagine that, eating a whole bag of tomatoes? Well, where's he at today? Well, he's in the bathroom, obviously, right? <laughs> Serves him right. But, but how ridiculous, right? Who would do that? I mean, and how would you feel? How would you feel if you had given generously to this guy and he wouldn't even share it with his own family? Well, I can tell you who you're going to give the tomatoes to next year, right? It's not going to be him because it, it would be insulting. It would be ridiculous to, to respond to generosity with a lack of generosity would be ridiculous. And friends, God has been so generous with us. How can we be anything less than generous with others? If you really understand God's generosity in your life, it makes being generous so much easier. And, and see, if, and, and you have to understand that that's not about how big your bank account is or, or what car you drive or what house you live in. God is generous with each of us in so many different ways. And we have the opportunity to show that generosity, to share that generosity with others. We've talked about generosity of time, of talent, of financial resources. And boy, it's just such a privilege for me to get to serve this church because I see how God uses your generosity in so many ways. Uh, we look at generosity of your time. Uh, one thing, one of the many things we've invited you to do this year is, is to serve. Uh, to, we invite you to, be in, to worship every week, to serve every week, to be in a community group every week. That's something we want for you to do. And so, so many of you have stepped forward in our children's ministry. We've told you that we have needs there. I mean, we, we are the church with a playground in the other end of the building, right? And yet we were struggling to have enough children's servants. We still need a few more, okay? So you can see Pam, she's, she's always on the hunt for folks. Uh, but we have dramatically increased our servants in children's ministry over the past couple months because you all have increased your generosity with your time. And I was talking uh, just this past week, I was talking to a guy named Nick. Nick and his family just started coming to Stillwater real recently, and they're making that decision as to whether or not Stillwater Church is the right place for them. And Nick said the thing that impressed him about Stillwater Church, he's got little kids, and when he brought his little kids in, they loved it. He said, this is the first church we've been at a while where we took them to the kids' ministry, and they didn't cry, and that's good. <laughs> now, we don't guarantee a 100% success rate in that. Some of my little benefactors have not always been good in that category, but nevertheless, um, they, it, is, it is a great thing that you are generous with your time to love on our kids. And maybe you've been sensing God tugging at your heart to get involved with that. This would be a great time to do that. So we're generous with, with our time. Uh, we're generous with our talents. There's countless examples of this, but a great one happened here just on Friday night. We had a wonderful event, Shedding Light on Human Trafficking, and Sue, Michelle, others uh, gave generously of their talent, because if you've ever planned something like that, it is hard work. I mean, you may have, if you would just show up, you have no idea the countless hours and, and all the coordination that that took to get every little detail right. And we had some, some folks who came in and they shared with us right here in this room. We had a great crowd of folks who came, Stillwater folks, folks, folks from outside of Stillwater, uh, we taught our, our children and youth about how to handle bullying, how to deal with that stuff, and, and we uh, talked about a very difficult issue in here, and we talked about ways that we can get involved and make a difference. And, you know, because of that sharing of talent that happened at this church, lives can be changed, and our world can be changed, because this, folks, is the greatest problem that the church faces today. This is, this is our moment to step forward in boldness and in courage and say, we won't let this happen on our kingdom watch. We're the people here who are called to step forward and to address this, and so we're going to do that. So great use of our talent, generosity with our talents uh, to make a difference. And finally, generosity with our resources. I want to invite Pat to come forward. Pat's here. There he is. Uh, Pat uh, was actually leading uh, the Kairos weekend that we had uh, just recently. Just uh, Was it last weekend, I think, Pat? And last weekend, two weekends yeah, ago? Yeah, last weekend. Excellent. And we asked you to be generous with one thing. What did we ask you to be generous with? Cookies. Absolutely. Cookies. And we brought in a whole lot of cookies. Pat, how many cookies do you guys take down there? We, as a team, our goal was to take 4,000 dozen cookies into the prison for the weekend. 4,000 dozen. 4,000 dozen. So what would that, mathematically about speaking? 48,000 cookies. 48,000 cookies as a team. So the team's made up of about, what, about 30 men, right? Uh, that's what our goal is, is okay. to be around 30 guys. We minister to 30 uh, inmates, or what we call, we refer to them as residents. Okay. So we have 30 of them that we work with 
for the weekend. Okay, so a team of 30 went from a whole bunch of churches. How many went from Stillwater? Uh, there were six of us from Stillwater. Very cool. Very cool. That's a great representation on that team. Yep. So, so we would have been responsible then for, for a lot of cookies. Tell me just a little bit. I've heard that they're called forgi- or some of them are called forgiveness cookies. What's that right. look like? Um, the forgiveness cookies are given on Saturday night. All day Saturday, there's a series of uh, talks that are given about forgiveness. And then in the evening, it culminates with a forgiveness ceremony where the guys write during the day on a piece of paper the people that they need to forgive. And then that in the ceremony gets put in the water and it disintegrates. Mm -hmm. And so they're supposed to let go of that. But then when they leave that night, they're given some cookies. Now, each night they're given cookies for themselves. But that night they're given some for themselves. But they're also given a bag of cookies. And they're supposed to give that bag to someone that they're supposed to forgive. Mm. And so that's a little bit convicting for them. It's in a place that forgiveness um, sometimes can be seen as a uh, sign of weakness Mm. for them. So it's kind of tough for them to do. So so you all's baking helped generate forgiveness among inmates for whom it probably would not have happened otherwise. Now, I've heard also that, so we can bring in 30 men. There's around, I think, 1,300 in the prison, and, mm-hmm. and but yet we had 300 who signed up for the weekend. So yep. why do so many sign up for this? Well, what happens is the, um, the chaplain puts out, here, we're going to have a Kairos weekend coming up. We do two at, at Southern, Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, or SOCF, uh, one in the fall, one in the spring. Well, when that sign-up goes out, the prison kind of calms down some. And because they know cookies are coming. They also know there's 30 guys that are going to be on that weekend. Mm-hmm. And so um, they sign up. They, there's a community or a, a committee in the prison that then chooses who's going to be on the weekend. And there's a few extra because you have to have some alternates in case somebody gets themselves in trouble, which mm-hmm. invariably happens. Um, but then what happens is we get those guys on Thursday night, and they come in, and most all of them say, and they, they introduce themselves, and they say, well, I'm here for the cookies um, or the food because we also feed them on the weekend. And so um, about Saturday, that changes, or at least we hear that it changes. Mm-hmm. And they start saying, you know, I came Thursday night because of the cookies, but I found something much more here. And, and, and what it is is guys that have been starved all, them lives, all their lives for um, the love that can be offered to them. Mm-hmm. And so now they've seen it, and now they see something completely different. The other thing the cookies do is they minister to everybody in the prison because we take cookies out to all of the inmates, and they get a bag of cookies. Um, also, we give them to the staff, and so the corrections officers – we give them to them. And there's a whole lot of collateral effect from those cookies that we don't even see. Mm -hmm. Now, we have seen a little bit, and there's some stories about that. But um, the cookies are are powerful. That's awesome. Pat, thank you so much for your leadership. We appreciate that. Do we have any other Kairos guys in here? Any other Kairos guys? See, yes, Terry's right there. Some others? Yes, very cool. Thank you, guys, for your, your generosity with your time. That's a big commitment to do that, and these guys have given generously, and God has blessed that. And, you know, your cookies, did, did, could you ever imagine that baking cookies would make such an impact? I mean, your cookies led to reduction in violence. Uh, it led to better relationships in the prison. Uh, it led to forgiveness, which, as Pat said, is not common in the prison environment. And best of all, it brought guys to Jesus Christ. You baked cookies, right? And yet when we are generous, that's what God can do with it. God can take our simple, humble acts of generosity, whether it's, it's cookies in a bag or, or a check in an offering plate or whatever it may be, God can take these things and do stuff so much beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. It, it, Pat talked about how we, we don't really fully know the collateral effects of these cookies. And the thing that's neat is that we, we challenge you guys to do this. And we, we challenge very specifically community groups because we've been talking in the past series about how community groups, we do more than just get together and have fun. That's important, but also we serve together. And
Four of our groups this time did something very interesting. They as a group said, this is going to be our service project for, for this season. We are going to bake cookies. Some of them even just dedicated entire group meetings uh, to bake cookies. And it was incredible. Thousands of cookies made this way. And, and one thing, I wouldn't share this outside of here, okay, because we don't want to be arrogant or whatever, but you need to know that we, we sent six of the guys on that team, which is a very large percentage of the team, but we sent 50% of the cookies. Stillwater Church, aren't, you guys are amazing. Good grief. 50% of the cookies for that whole team, that's like 24,000 cookies, came as a result of you or the network of people that you brought in and said, this is good and this is important. And friends, it excites me so much because you are a generous church. And I see what God does with our generosity today, and I can't wait to see what God is going to do with our generosity tomorrow and the next day and the next day and as it continues. God, thank you for this church. Thank you for the generosity that we see here. God, would you grow us in that? Lord, I pray that you would help each of us as individuals to see more and more ways that we can be generous with our time, our talent, and our resources. And God, we're asking that you would take these humble gifts, that you would bless them, that you would use them to build your kingdom. God, I pray that you would help us to be truly joyful givers, cheerful givers who give not under compulsion, but because we love you and because we want to see your kingdom grow. Lord, may your kingdom come, may your will be done among us and through us, God. We love you and we, we pray this all in your holy name. Amen.